Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. This is Elizabeth Townsend Gard, your host, and I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School and a faculty fellow at the A.B. Friedman School of Business at Tulane. And I just want a quilt. So today we talk to author Thomas Knauer. He's got a new book out, Why We Quilt. It's on contemporary quilters, and it is the prettiest book I've ever seen. We talk to him about his life and the new book and all kinds of things. Thomas Knauer calling from Clinton, New York. Awesome. And uh, what's your first memory of someone sewing or quilting in your life? I have no memories of anyone quilting at all. Um, it just wasn't done in my family. Though my mother from, you know, I guess my first memory is her making me a Halloween costume. What did she uh, make she you? She showed me an angel. An angel. Interesting. Yes, I wanted to be an angel. I have no idea why. I think I was five. Lovely. I like that. I was, I was adorable. You <laughs> were adorable. I suspect you were. Um, and so how did you come? I mean, I know a little bit about it, but let's pretend I don't. How did you come to quilting? Um, lots of accidents. Um, I was up until 2008, I was teaching uh, digital media uh, and especially experimental new media. Um, and then I got catastrophically ill um, with mystery disease that took two years to figure out, or at least took two years to figure out mystery disease one. We now know there are two mystery diseases Amazing. that we figured out, but it took two years to figure out mystery disease one, during which time my academic life kind of, well, just ended. Uh, the school was not very supportive. Let's I understand just leave that. It at that. No, I get that. My kid is, at, we, we're in the midst of mystery disease. I mean, we think we might know what it is, but nobody knows. Um, with my kid and her uh, middle, her high school was so horrible about it um that we have now switched and she's at a, doing a very different way of of school but um it added to the str- i mean instead of being like oh, i'm so sorry that you're ill let, tell me what can i do to help they were the worst they made it so much worse um by all the ridiculous things that they kept doing and adding things and putting her on medical leave when she didn't want to go i mean it was just the worst so i am sorry that that you went through that partic- particularly at the professional level because it's um, it's not what you want, you know. No, um, so. it was really it was rough. It was you know the only thing I ever wanted to be was a professor. Um, yeah. From the time I was nine. Wow. Because um, I'd gone to Princeton as part of the math team, and I learned at age nine there's a place where your job is to keep learning stuff. Yeah. And I was like, that's just what I want to do. Right. Um, but anyway. After the two years, I'm starting to feel a little bit better. My mother is visiting, and um, well, let's step back one one step. Okay. At about three, we found that baby clothes turns into toddler clothing, and toddler clothing, at least a decade ago, was really borderline awful. Yeah. Um. We had gone shopping for my daughter and we saw a future Mrs. Bieber t-shirt made for three-year-olds. That's <laughs> not good. <laughs> at, at an actual, at a store. And, and, and it just was, this is horrible. I decided yeah. I was going to make all of her clothing from now on. My mother was visiting. She got a sewing machine out of the attic. We had a sewing machine that had never been used, but was sent to us by my wife's mother on the note when we told her that we were having a kid on the notion that you're going to be a mom now you need a sewing machine Uh uh-huh that was going to live in the attic forever until this day when i said mom can you teach me how to use it so she gave me a quick sewing lesson then we went to joanne's and i whipped up a dress for my daughter and she took one look at it and was just floored you made that for me 
It's really cool. That is my princess dress. That's so cool. So I, in the next two weeks, made her 10 more dresses. Started experimenting with applique, doing all kinds of stuff, upcycling old shirts of mine, the whole nine yards. And a friend of a friend was a fabric designer and saw them on Facebook through the whole how a friend of a friend sees things right, sometimes. Right. That's right. And, and made the suggestion that I should try my hand at fabric design. Um, you know, I'd been an artist for 20 years. Right. Sure, why not? Right. So I designed some fabric, sent it off to Andover Fabrics, and they're a quilting company, and they say yes. And next thing I know, I'm designing fabric for a quilting company, to which I respond... I should probably make a quilt. <laughs> just to see how Just to see. Just maybe. Just one. <laughs> how patterns get like changed. The right. pattern is affected by being cut up small versus being used for a dress or a skirt or right. whatever. Um I made uh I made I design and make a quilt. Because of course I'm gonna design it myself because right. I'm a thing. Right. Um I didn't even think about getting a pattern. Did you look around? Did you know what kind of – was it just coming from your sort of uh, artistic amazingness or did you look um, – that was my kid. Um, uh, did you um, – It just came out of nowhere. Yeah? Just, you just made it. You didn't, you didn't go yeah. looking for what, what quilts looked like. You just did it – no. Okay. Quilts are patchworky. That was my understanding. So that, that was sort of – that was the extent of my research at this point. Yeah. Um. So I designed something that worked. I, I, I finish it. I hold it up for my daughter, and Sit. she just looks at it. Yeah. For a second, and then says, "Is that for me?" <laughs> yeah. You're like and the she, magical dad. <laughs> yeah, she just runs at me, and I just fold around her with the quilt wrapped around her, and oh. she let me just hug her for like thirty seconds. Yeah. Which was the longest hug she had ever let me give her. Um, because she's on the autism spectrum. Oh, interesting. And face to face hugs are hard. She wouldn't let us do them, they were really yeah. hard for her. But wrapped in the quilt, she no just way. stood there and let me hug her. That is so and cool. I was just addicted. I just then said, All right, I make quilts now and apprenticed myself for the next year and made, I think, about 30 quilts in the next mm-hmm. year. Um, just how did you, when you, when you decided to go all in, how did you, what was that apprenticeship look, what did that look like? Lots of going on YouTube to learn new techniques. Got it. Um, I designed every quilt I made, um, but that was part of the apprenticeship. How do I design quilts? Right. Um, but I, a whole lot of YouTubing for technique, um, and just figured it out as I went along. Um, and so I what quickly, year is this? Help us understand the time frame. This would be 2010. Mm-hmm. Um, so I took that year and then shortly thereafter, um, my first line of fabric comes out. Of course, at that point, this was early days of the modern quilt movement. Right. I don't even know if the Modern Quilt Guild existed yet. Right. Um, or at least not nationally. I think it did in L.A. Um, so anybody that was designing anything modern at all was getting and had a name at all. So as a fabric designer with a name in the industry. Right. Everybody was getting offered book deals. And, of course, I got offered a book deal. Yeah. Um, and, next, I, and I got offered the book deal based on one quilt. Amazing. Um, and it was complete lunacy. It was, <laughs> it was ridiculous that I then said, I, yes, I can come up with a book's worth of quilts in the next nine months. Wow. That's um, after but, year one of learning techniques, or is that during your year one? That's after year one. That's after year one. So you've got a little bit under your belt, but you're just still like, whoa, like this is crazy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, I, I – I took to sewing really quickly because I learned one thing. A sewing machine is a bandsaw. 
Okay. When it comes to the hand movements and the process and everything, and I was trained as a sculptor originally. So you way back in ancient history. Yeah. So the sewing machine just was like, this is natural movement to That's me. That's really interesting. So it was a pretty quick learning curve. Yeah. Um, to get to get half decent to be able to make quilts that lay flat. Very interesting. Things like that. Love it. Um, okay, so you have your book deal. And so how is your life, so that's like almost a decade ago, right? So how is your life, what is your life like now? And, and that time period that you're in is such a magical, weird place for quilting. Like all, like it's a, it's a very different time than now, I think. There's a lot of room, oh. there's a lot of creativity, modern movements happening, internet starting, like all these crazy things are happening at this particular right. time, right? Um, yes. Really magical time to be quilting. So tell me, yeah, like, absolutely, yeah. So a decade, it, it, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. There yeah, no, it was incredible. Of just everybody was popping up, and there was so much excitement, and so many young new quilters, yeah, coming out of nowhere, yeah, um, and saying, "I can do this." Um, then the recession hit. Yes. And the industry completely retrenched back to where it was before modern quilting hit. Interesting. In my, in my, in, yeah. I think it's become very risk averse. Yeah. Um, so it's very back to as, you know, what is our core audience? Our core audience are later middle aged white women. Right. Um, versus it being, Wow, this youth movement we're, we're trying to attract. Yeah. Why do you think? Do why do you think that? Thing, yeah. But. Why do you think that is? Do you think that the buying? I mean, it seems like the buying power power of the the modern quilters would be strong enough to sort of shift the conversations. I think it is. I think a lot of it has to do with the way fabric is sold, the whole rep process. Yeah. Reps are comfortable going to the shops they're comfortable going to. Yeah. And they like going to the shops where the shop owner is not going to pick and choose out of a line, but will just buy the whole K facet. Interesting. Will buy the whole, I don't want to name names, um, okay. but will we'll buy the conventional or more traditional fabric designers, will buy yeah, their whole the collection safe. versus. Well, they see is safe. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there are there are more there are more traditional quilt shops than there are shops that carry modern stuff. Yeah. Um it's just then where do the reps want to spend their energy? Right. They're gonna to go to the shops they've been going to for twenty years. Yeah. I think the whole process of using reps is obsolete and ridiculous, but yeah. what would you say they should be doing instead? You can send swatches. It's cheap. Yeah. Send two inch swatches, and then a design, and, and then they can see the larger print online. Digital. Yeah. They can see the whole thing, but they can get a little swatches, two inch swatches, so they can see the color live. Yeah. Just send it to the shops. Yeah. It's cheaper than sending a rep. Right. And then order online. Yeah. And you're not going to have then the bias of what the rep wants to show. Yeah. I know I had experiences of reps being at quilt market and seeing reps show my line going, I know you're not going to like this one. Really? But this one seems like it's really right for your shop and showing something else using wow. mine as a foil. That's terrible. Um, but it worked. It was effective yeah. selling. That's terrible. And that's, all that mattered right versus what? um really letting the shops see everything when yeah. you've got 20 minutes with a shop owner you can't show them every single line right you sell them what you think they'll buy right very interesting um, right and we are very con we're contemplative like if you have a opportunity to be online and think about things you might have more thoughtful buying because you don't have to right. make a decision very quickly whereas yeah. you've got to make your buy right then and there with the rep and yeah. that's your 
or your you can call it in, I guess, but mm. what role do you think market plays in all this? Market's about to happen in a couple of weeks. Um, what role does market play? I really, I, I think markets is obsolete as <laughs> reps yeah. are. Right. Um, it's. I think they made a big mistake when they changed their credential rules and kicked out bloggers. That's really interesting. Um, because bloggers brought so much free advertising. Yeah. Um, they reported on market for weeks. One trip to market would be weeks or months worth of blog posts and yeah. social media. Yeah. And it brought energy and excitement and people could that didn't go to market could see all the stuff. Right. And now, if people know, if the users know all the fabric that's out there, yeah, they're less likely to be satisfied with what's in their local shop. Is that why you think that it they shifted the credentials? Do you think there was pushback from the I shops? Think that, I think it. I think shop owners didn't like them there. Yeah. I think. They didn't like bloggers wanted to make appointments with fabric companies to see the new collections uh-huh. and companies thought, saw that as a waste of time instead yeah. of seeing it as free marketing. Right. Yeah. Um, and now so it was a kind of generational well, problem, right. right? Like a disconnect, a generational disconnect in yeah. some way where you get shop owners who are older bloggers who are younger and that, that there was kind of almost a, you know, kind of, uh, it was all shifting and they didn't really realize what was happening. Is that what you, right. yeah. And, and I think the companies themselves, the fabric companies did yeah. not really see that, Hey, this is, this is massive amounts of unpaid advertising right. for us. Right. 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 Um, totally. You still that, don't see at market when I, we, we've been twice, we're going this, a third time this year. You still don't see a lot of social media happening at market. No. It kind of surprises me, or even festival. Any of like, it's it's an odd thing to be have when you see somebody actually using social media, which I, just surprises me. Um, no, I find it to be a very depressing place now. Yeah, I don't go unless I absolutely have to, and I don't absolutely have to. Interesting. Because I committed career suicide uh, <laughs> years ago. Yeah. What do you mean by well, that? You're not going to be a successful fabric designer when you're making quilts about gun violence. Yeah, right. The political, um, the political changes your position in the industry. Is that what you're saying? Right. Yeah. 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 I'm no longer a safe neutral. Do you think that's still true? I mean, with all the protest quilting and all the stuff, I mean, do you think that there's still a sense of... Well, that... look at how many fabric designers are making protest quilts. That's true. It's very true. I think, yeah. <laughs> there are protest quilters, but they're not no. really in the industry. No. You got a Jackie Gearing getting, is it Paintbrush Studio who picked her up uh, for a, yeah. that's pretty much it. I can't think of anything, any others that are like. Right. Which and she's got a name that's so gigantic that she's worth the risk. Right. She's got a name that's so gigantic for other reasons besides right just her protest that's quotes, right she's got other people don't even know her protest work right right so interesting weird right and protest yep. qu- stuff is so big okay so let's <laughs> i totally adore you <laughs> um okay so your book is coming out is it out is it, it out come, comes out tuesday oh it's so exciting um okay so your book is called why we quilt and it's gorgeous. You sent. Uh, it's gorgeous. It's just the prettiest book ever. We're writing books right now that are very about. Um, so I'm a law professor, and so we've been studying uh, this for now two years. And so we're now fi- I'm finally writing, and so we're doing these very much how-to books about like trademark and all that. So it's not very glamorous. So when I saw your book, I was like, oh, that's the prettiest book I've ever seen. And especially since, like, I know it, like, we've been, like, getting these proofs done and all that. I'm like, ours does not look like that. Um, But it's really, really, really pretty. It also tells a story of why we quilt and its contemporary voices, which is super interesting. And in very, in many ways, so we've done about 300 interviews over the last year and a half, two years, um, of all kinds of people. 
And what I sort of, and as I started to write an intro for one, because we're doing multiple books, I was kind of amazed at like how much parallel there was to what I've been seeing and what you did in your book. So um, we're not doing a book like yours again. We're doing stuff on copyright. It has nothing to do with your book. But in terms of the themes that I'm seeing and what I'm sort of very moved by, it very much mimicked the chapters you did. So I thought what we might be able to do is go, and I think that to the listeners who have listened to a lot of these shows, I think they're gonna, it's going to resonate with them as well. So I thought maybe, first of all, the structure of the book is gorgeous. I mean, the, the, the fat photographer, the photography in the quilt is amazing. That's great. Sure. All books are, like, all quilt books are, like, really beautiful and, like, we like right. the aesthetics. The writing, the structure, the story you're telling, how you integrate history and basics and, like, like what you did here is just really, really beautiful. So I have to just say, because I've been doing a ton of quilt history right now, and just the way you, you interweave it, it's really elegant. It's just Thank great. You. We, it's just a we, beautiful book. We we spent a long time, uh, my editor, myself, and the publisher, the three of us working together, trying to figure out just how to format this thing. Yeah, that was when I was reading it. I was like, how did you come up with how you're telling this story? Because it is not, it is, it's not like anything I've really seen before. Um, and I've been doing a lot of looking. So tell me a little bit about that process and, and what, how this happened exactly. Um, it was written, I mean, it was originally written in two chunks, one history section and then the my section on what quilting fulfills for us today. Right. Um, since it's completely impractical. Right. Um, and we knew that was... A, absolutely terrible way right to present right. the information right um because just to pause for people who don't understand so my husband used um he still teaches but he used to have to teach english composition so we would have this exercise where they'd have to group stuff and grouping by color is the stupidest thing right, right. it's the easiest but it doesn't tell any story and so that's what you're saying and by putting the quilt by dividing it that way it was really easy but not very helpful in terms of actually creating a narrative. Right. Right. Okay. Um, when we thought of, I think what really it came down to was breaking it into segments that let you eat something and digest it. Yeah. Or like moving that. on. Yeah. Um, and so we sort of logic out what are those seven main, I think it was seven categories uh -huh. or seven reasons why we quilt today. Yeah. Um, and then tried to make, that put them in an order that made sense. It's really a great um, book. I mean, it's complicated. history that's going on. It was it, it's a, lot a lot. Is, a lot of it is just, let's chunk it out and, throw it against the wall and see which way it sits best. Yes, it's gorgeous. So and um, it, it's just got, it's got a lot of craft. It's got, it's it's a very mature book. It's just a very elegant, cool book. And again, I, I, I you know. I owe story a lot for that. Yeah. Um, I love working with them. I'm very happy to be not at a quilt publisher. Yeah. Um, they, I think I'm their quilter. Interesting. Um, they, they do other things. They do all kinds of things. Um, they're all over the place. They're a niche publisher with a hundred niches. It's amazing. Um, and so they really know, they don't have a formula yeah. for how a quilt book should be done. So they really took time to help me shape this thing into intelligent shape. It's a, it's beautiful. Well, let me let me just just so people are listening, each chapter is structured in the same way. So, it's got a theme, it's got a little piece of history, it's got a little bit of interviews or quotes from people, and then it's got long, it's got quotes and then it's got longer a longer pieces from pieces, voices of quilting. Is that right? Am I doing that right? 
Right. And then it has a short essay from me or a short bit from me in each chapter of why why I think we quilt. Yeah, it's great. And then it's got a little bit and and you prog- the way you've structured it, it progresses through history as well. So it's got this like yeah. dual track and also you're sort of talking about like oh, I mean, it's just like People, you have to buy this book. It's so insane. And I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't get paid for that. So I, I think that it's just really interesting, um, the structure of it. It's just really, really structured in, in, in a very cohesive, interesting, and it keeps you reading kind of way, you know? Well, the it's book really is, cool. is that there's a whole lot, there's a whole lot in there. Yeah. Or being about 35,000 words. There's a whole lot of content. Yeah, it really um, is. Versus me writing a, I think there's as much there as there would be if I had written a book twice as long. Yeah. We did a lot of editing down. There's, it's got a kind of poetry to it, and I think that because of the way it's written, that you can't, you do get. There's kind of a poetic element. I mean, there's narrative and there's writing, but there is a kind of a succinctness to it that is really quite lovely. All right. So I'd like to go just through some of the chapters and just to give people a taste. So I love the titles of your chapters. So chapter one is, We Quilt to Connect with a Rich Tradition, which I think is totally true, right? I I mean, do you think every, do you you have to be aware of history to know you're connecting with a tradition or sort of what role does history play in what we do? I think at the very least, every quilter recognizes that quilting is a nostalgic act. Yeah. Um, So they are connecting to something that they know, they think of as a 19th century practice. Right. Um, So they are connecting to a tradition, whether they know anything about the tradition or not. Right. In their head is the notion of I'm connecting to something. Yeah, that's it, me. yeah, and whether that's like the lone quilter quilting at night, or you're gathering pe- with people, or right. whatever it is, some there is something connected. You're, you're you're never quite alone when you're working on a quilt because there it is. There is so there are so many layers of history. Yeah, just inherent in the practice. Yeah, it's great. Okay. We quilt to explore and express our creativity. I hear this all the time. I ask people why they quilt and they feel the need, whatever their job is or if they're retired, they just have to get the creativity out of their body. Like the, that there's something about humanness and creativity that is inherently linked for some. And, quil- and quilting is so good for creative uh, such a range of creative expression yeah if you don't feel confident and you're not a designer and you're not freewheeling you can get a pattern but you still make a few choices of the fabrics yeah. and you make some choices on the how it's quilted yeah and you are inserting your own voice into an existent pattern all the way to i'm inventing the i'm just inventing a brand new quilt out of nowhere right and I am master creator. Yeah. Uh, it, it is such a continuum of, there is such a continuum of expression yeah. that quilting allows. Yeah. It's... And quilting helps you to become more creative. I think, because that, yeah. You, you gain confidence with right. each It's skill. It's make. skill building, right? Like art school, like anything. When you do more of it, you do, you get better. And, um, and I think I also argue in the book that, um really that's always why quilting's been done. The whole myth of quilting being practical is is nonsense. Yeah. It never made it never made sense to get small small pieces of fabric <laughs> and put them together in a very <laughs> intricate pattern to right. make a blanket. No. Right. It would be practical to have two big pieces of cloth. Right. Sew them together, stuff right. them with cotton and there you go. That's right. Exactly. Um, and on the other side of it, I always feel like, um, cause we do get sort of conversations about like kits and I, you know, I always think of a kit and if you're going to just be honest to the kit, like you make a kit and I think I want to make that thing. It's like you're a part puzzler, 
but you get to kind of step into the the mind of the artist and I think in some way we don't we don't honor the people that want to do kits because there is a beauty of doing that you know that there's a kind of I get to be in like your creative space and I get to put it together and there's something very thrilling about that part too I think and for those people there's something meaningful in the act of doing I think so I like um, all of it I do kits I do my own stuff but I, I there is something very meaningful and very... I collect people on numbers, so yeah. I understand. Paint by numbers, understand yes. The, the kit. It's, yeah, it's, it's the kit. There's something about it, it right? It, it, there's a, there's a security blanket there, of I'm I'm nervous. Yeah. About attempting yeah. to invent, but I want to make. I want to be part of this tradition, and I love doing this. Yeah. I think there's, I, there's something I, really wonderful about just that. I love doing it. I this. love doing it. Totally. I think about like the kits that I've got. Someone gave me a um, Tula Pink, her all star kit, which was a like, big circle. Um, and I remember doing that and thinking, wow, this is not that difficult. I mean, there's a little bit of skill involved. But like, I felt very connected to Tula as an artist and as like mm-hmm. she created this, she thought of this. Now I'm doing it. And there's a connection to whoever was that designer. Right. That is kind of an interesting bond that isn't happen in other things you do, right? Like, right. Um, and I think that's really cool for us to like be with the artist for that period of time. And you're there with the artist for a long time because you're quilting it, you're piecing it, and you're quilting it, and you're doing all these things. And um, I, I think it's cool. Okay, let's continue. Uh, we quilt to move beyond consumer culture. I like that one. So tell me about that one. I think that's a big part of the the rise of quilting in the 30 and 40 year old bracket was that they wanted they were making things for their children and they wanted those things to matter yeah um they knew they could buy something at ikea but there was a blankness yeah and as we've become as parenting has become more and more <laughs> to be a good parent now demands that you have this bond with your child that was never demanded of my parents. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's particularly fair. It's kind of a whole lot to put on a relationship. Yeah. But um, in, in, it does make us think more meaningfully about what are these gestures? What is right. this thing that my child is sleeping under? Right. Did I make that? And will they have that and pass that down to their child? Well, and it's yeah. your, you know. I don't your... want to buy this thing. I want to make it. Yeah, there's something that is, and that's why we see the charity quilting. That's why we see all kinds of things. It's your kid's reaction to the quilt. Like, she knew that was your, I mean, I always say, like, like, and we talked about this with a lot of people. There's something about the act of quilting that you add a little bit of love. Like, there's something like, you're, like, sewing it into the fibers of the quilt, and somehow people know. Like, there's just well, more to it than just piecing it together. The good Marxist that I am. yes. We'll place it as, you know, that is, you know, our labor is a part of our life. That's right. And you are giving in the hours right. and hours and hours and hours and hours That's and right. hours it takes right. to make a quilt. You are giving a chunk of your life to That's someone right. else. Totally agree. And on and, my side with property, we call it a Lockean labor theory or, or a Hegelian personhood theory, that these this, this act of doing, it, it is, I mean... It's about time, right? It's about love. It's about the choices you're making with your short time on earth that you decide to make this thing for this person is pretty right. remarkable. Right. Yeah, it's outside of consumer Fordist time in a way that is um, awesome. It's, it's again, it's, I think quilting is so often about making gestures. Yeah. And I think one of the greatest gest- the grand gesture of quilting is to give a quilt away. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. All right. Um, so the other ones are creating a connection with loved ones, quilts to change the world, quilts because we can and because we cannot help but to do so. These are just like, 
So I don't want to give it all away because it's amazing, but um, it's really a great read, and um, I just totally love it. Now, tell me also for those that are listening. There's a lot of fame, a lot of voices that you will already have: um, Sherry Lynn Woods, Marianne Fonds, Mary Fonds, Sean Kimber, who's been on the show a bunch of times, Jackie Gearing. There's a whole bunch of them that you know from listening to Just Want a Quilt. So it's fun to see them all together in a book. Um, right. Tell me how you chose who is in the book. Part of it was very simple. Um, these are, some of them are just the friends I've made in the quilting world that I have grown to respect. But part of it was also really trying to get a range of voices. Um, Lynette Anderson uh, from Australia is does primitive quilting. Um, and I love her work. You wouldn't expect me to be a fan of that genre. Yeah. But I love her work. It is, it is loving work. Um, it is just sweet. But she sidesteps saccharin, I think. Um, which is hard to do um, because she always has stories behind the quilts she makes. Um, I really wanted to not have it be using Linda Gass, an art quilter who I, you know, I, um, I have a big focus on practical quilts on bed quilts, that is yeah. what I'm most interested in, but bringing in these other voices that approach quilting differently than each other. Yeah. That I wanted to find, and then I found, and as I expected to find, there were common themes coming from all of them. Yeah. Even though they were so dis- they, they are so distinct from each other. Um, th- they're there was a similarity in, and yeah, I was shooting for a similarity and difference in this set of people. It's very cool. All right, I've got like three more questions. We're going to totally get this done. Um, the AIDS quilt, you mentioned that a couple of times. Tell me the, the role and the importance of that, the, the names project. So I didn't grow up with quilts or quilters. I had no clue about quilts until really I encountered the AIDS quilt in college. Mm-hmm. And was just blown away by this notion of quilts being about telling a story, quilts being about being angry about something, yeah, potentially, or being quilts about grief, yeah. Um, all of that influence later on, I found when I became a quilter, yeah, all of those were things that are essential to the way I come up with the quilts I make. I don't make a lot of quilts anymore um, because a lot of times they're just emotionally brutal to work on. Yeah. Um, But it's, it's the AIDS quilt that I hold up as this ideal of, really being able to tell story in a way that no other, almost no other object on the planet can tell a story. It's insanely remarkable. I mean, the whole thing is remarkable. Um, The profile to this situation, the love, like the love, right? Like this is like making visible people who people were discarding and making it into this incredible thing. And, I've only seen little bits and pieces of it. I haven't seen the whole thing together. But it um, it's just everybody. There's Some of them are brutally, uh, you know, sad. And some are uplifting. Some are, are very basic. Some are incredible. Um, and it's like the essence of sort of what it means to be creative. What it means. To, it's all the essence of what yeah. we've just been talking about um, in and this kind of way. It's just a beautiful, beautiful piece. And the brilliance of it is, is it's, it's a rhizome a part that has no center. Yeah. Any subset can be, can stand for the whole. Right. Right. And that's Um, what I've seen. I've only seen like a small exhibit in Chicago. So, and it didn't matter that it was only, you know, 
I don't know, maybe 50 or 100 of them. But it it, it still was, like, incredibly moving. Right. Um, and, uh, and it isn't about perfection. It's about all the things we've been talking about, expression and love and creativity and remembrance and all those things. It's kind of, it's just remarkable. Yeah, I aspire to that um, I when I make quilts or a series of quilts. Yeah. I don't achieve that. But it's what I aspire towards. Um, really cool. I want to make work that is resonant. Okay, so on that, I'm really, and I want to talk about the Sunbonnet, your Sunbonnet Sue quilt as well. Um, so, because I think it's really interesting. So, your Sunbonnet Sue quilt, everybody knows Sunbonnet Sue, big hat, hat sideways. It's an iconic um, figure. And you added what to Sunbonnet Sue? Um, AR 15s. And what is an AR-15, in case people don't know? It, it's an assault rifle. Assault rifle. Um, and it every every single Sioux, they're very cute, but they have a rifle. And so tell me a little bit about that piece, and um, how was the reception of that piece, and, and, and sort of the process? Um, it's, it's, about a lo- it's, it's about a bunch of things. It's one, it's... It... it I came up with that quilt in in a rare way, just all at once. The image was in my head and it came into my head after the first time my daughter had a a school shooter drill. They're awful, right? And then the discussion of arming teachers. Yes. Um, why not just arm students? Um, that's yeah. the next logical step. Um, I wanted to have this contrast of innocence and then the brutality of putting the rifle in. And the most important part of the whole quilt is the one block with no Sue. That's the missing child. The missing kid. So Um, for people listening, it's a four by four of Sue's except for the bottom right hand corner. There's no, there's nothing. It's empty. And I think that's just as long as we're going down this path, we're going with being a weaponized country. Um, that empty block is the inevitable result, and it's yeah. going to keep happening. Yeah. Yes. And making sunbonnet sue is why I'm never going to be a fun, you know fabric designer again. Yeah. So interesting. Built like that. Really? Um, but they're what you I need to that make keep, because, that, because that piece I'm you think, an angry man. You're an angry man. I'm. I get it. You think that piece would keep you from designing fabric because of that piece, or because you just don't want to deal was, deal with it? I was boy. I was threatened with a boycott after speaking out on social media after the Sandy Hook shootings. Really? Yes. As a fabric designer, I was threatened with a boycott by multiple shops. That's so insane. Multiple large shops. Like what's, what's wrong? That's insane, right? I don't get it. But I do. I do understand it. Because? It, because they want... There is still a belief in the marketing world that the best way to be is... Neutral. Is to maintain neutrality. Yeah. Therefore, your audience can't get upset right whereas i think good marketing is to actually use your voice well yeah and you will get a highly responsive audience right it won't be the whole world right. but it will be a highly involved and highly committed and a highly responsive audience versus if you're pure neutrality yeah you don't know who you're going to capture no no, and it's and it's at least for me, it's an inauthentic voice. It right. seems to me that like we've had a lot our controversies. So I interview lots. I I love protest quilts. I love 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 them. I love them beyond love them. They're just moving. I feel like art on fabric that's protest quilts is haunting beyond words. A way that a painting isn't somehow taking something you wrap your kid in and yeah. putting these images on it is incredible. Anyway. We don't get a lot of pushback on any of that, which I think is really interesting. What we do get, which is interesting, people accept it, it's whatever, you know. But what I do get pushback on is my kid is uh, identifies as trans and non-binary. She's a non-binary kid. Um, and if, I, if that comes up, 
the people that don't like that want to say, don't be political. Don't, why is that in here? Like it's, right. and it's this notion of like either it's, I mean, it's mostly, I would say sort of a Republican or, or like, I don't know. I think they're Republicans that are saying, keep all the politics out, like keep it neutral. Don't have that in there where then we'll get a huge thing of defense. People being like, that's, you know, you can't do that. You know what I mean? Like, it's a very interesting time we live in where certain one half of the country feels like they can protest and talk and rage and say what they want to say. And then the other ones are like, let's just stay neutral. You know, like, that's the response, at least on our group, which is super interesting and weird. You know, I mean, I know that there's radical Trumps and all that kind of stuff. I get that. But we don't get that in our group. Um, You know, neutrality is political in and of itself. I think so too, right? I think a dangerous political position. Yeah, I agree. I have never held it. Yes. And I feel like in the times we live in and the kid that I have, I can't be that way. Like, I have to be a support, like... You have to stand up for people and and uh, and and have your voice strong um, in a time that's so um, difficult. So anyway, that's a whole nother thing. Okay, last question because we're almost out of time. Um, copyright and the photographs and the book. Um, tell me any issues that arise, or how did you how did you take the photographs and did you have who owns the who own like tell me more about the copyright side of this book. Um. Well, all the, most of the historical quilts came from the International Quilt Study Center Museum. Nice. Um, I loved them. Um, and they were great to work with in terms of getting permission to use the historical images. That's and so cool. Cut me a great deal um, on it. Um, props to them. It's um, so great. As far as then, I think, you know, I'm not sure. I think Story used an in-house publisher, an in-house photographer for the photographs that they took. So they have copyright of those photos, but not the quilts, clearly. Right. Um, And then we had a separate permission for people who sent in usable images of their quilts. Right, and you've got all of the copyright notice at the very beginning of your book, which is very lovely. So you can sort of know exactly where everything came from. You even include the page numbers, I think, on that, which is really, really responsible. Um, It was was a feat to get it all done. Um, we, We had a couple you know, places bulk at, with historical quilts of not wanting to give international rights mm-hmm. and only wanting to give uh, the, uh, these rights, not the rights we needed. Right. Um, so a couple of quilts I wanted in there couldn't be in there, but um, we were able to find close enoughs um, at the IQSCM. Yeah. Because they have just about everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was something we were really conscious of and really careful with from the get go yeah. of we 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 can't be about giving voice to these quilters and then exploit them right. <laughs> by using really dubious copyright pro- practices yeah, totally. or something. I agree. I totally agree. Well, I think you're as I said, I love this book and I love its cop the <laughs> I love the copyright notices as much as I love the rest of the book. Um, this has just been such a delight. Such a delight. Anything else before we um, – I imagine it's on Amazon and other places. If people are listening, they want to learn about the book, where do they go? Um, you want a good look? I'll look. They can go to my – go to thomascanowersows.com. And um, uh, spell that for them. Uh, Thomas and then uh, spell your last name. Knauer, K-N-A-U-E-R. Mm-hmm. Sows dot com. Um, yeah, it's on Amazon too already. It's, so on, it's on Amazon. Amazon. Yeah. Um, I'm not selling it because I try to avoid retail. Cool. Um, so you're okay with them going to Amazon? You're still getting. I'm a okay percentage. with them going to Amazon. Go to your local quilt shop and ask them to order it. Yeah, it's uh, great. Go to your local bookstore. Ask them to order it right now. If you're really gung ho, you can pre-order it still and have it arrive on the fifteenth. Exciting. Go, so bang on, cool. go bang on your local quilt shop and yeah. say you should you need to carry this. Yeah, very cool. 
Um, well, I think this is just amazing and wonderful, and you're, it's been such a delight. Thank you so much, and really thank you a lot. I appreciate you um, coming to chat, and it was such a great um, – Will, uh, do you need to review this before we post it? Not at all. I have faith. Cool. You have faith. Um, cool. And then we will, um, once we are posting it, we'll let you know so you can do whatever you want with it. Um, and uh, I don't know. It's just awesome. It's great. It was great. Thank you. All right. Hold on while I um, turn off the recording. So you've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. And I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gard. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us. We talk about a lot of things. We also have an Instagram account. And of course, most importantly, I really hope you get a chance to quilt today.